Amen. Hey, you can turn to Matthew 24 in your Bibles. That's where we're actually uh, at. We're looking at and studying, as you're well aware of, I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, on the sign of His coming, understanding the Olivet Discourse. This is from the Lord Himself. He was asked about what will be, when, when you will come and what will be the sign of your coming. Uh, as he was, he, they were talking about the temple and no stone will be left upon another and the disciples are like confused uh, as to what that's going to look like, when is it going to happen, and the Lord went into the Olivet Discourse. Where we find ourselves today is in chapter 9 of your textbook, so if you want to get over there as well, we're looking at Matthew 24, verse 31. And uh, he... And he, this is, this is the actual return now. If you remember last chapter, that's what we were focused on. The second coming of Jesus Christ. The actual coming. And as he comes now, we find in verse 31, And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. And so this is the verse that's at hand. This is the next step or the next uh, thing the Lord tells us about His coming. This will happen when I come back. When I get here, I will send my angels forth. And so that's what's happening here. The gathering together of the elect. And uh, if you noticed, if you read this chapter, and by the way, if you didn't, it would do you well to read this chapter. And you say, well, why is that, Pastor? I didn't think it was that good of a chapter, that great anyway. It was kind of, uh, you know, it, it kind of went off on Israel and this and that. Now, this chapter is very, very important because of what's going on in today's church. Uh, a lot of churches today believe that the church is Israel. Uh, they teach that. That is their theology, that we have replaced Israel due to the fact that they rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected their Messiah. Jesus said, I reject you. And he turns and now the church becomes Israel. And everything that was promised to Israel were the recipients of. I say to that, baloney. That's not right. That's not biblical. You're not going to find it in Scripture. And I've told you over and over and over, if you want to understand eschatology, uh, the doctrine of future events, God's working in the future, you have to understand what? The unconditional covenants. You have to have a grip on that. Because I'm going to tell you, if you don't understand the Abrahamic, the Davidic, the Palestinian, and the new covenants uh, that the Lord said, I will. He didn't say, if you do. He said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I will do this. I will make this happen. And we're going to look at these things. And this chapter really gives you a very concise, uh, coming out of this Olivet Discourse, a very concise lesson, if you will, not only on the Olivet Discourse in this verse, but on the idea that Israel can be replaced. If you read this, what's your conclusion? There's no way. You can't do it. And, and scriptures do not even bear it out. But I'm going to tell you, if you got those covenants down and you understand that God made literal, uh, unconditional covenants, agreements, pacts with Israel, with the nation Israel, with the people, with Abraham, individuals. Because to me, that's important too. Uh, not just the national, because I don't like that whole idea of these promises only getting swallowed up with the national identity. That's the biggest part of it. But the reality is, is if he, if he changed, if, if, if I'm Abraham and he said, through you this is all going to happen, and then we get down the road and he says, you blew it, your people blew it, now I, that promise I made to you specifically, that changes. I meant through your seed, the spiritual seed. That's what, what we have with this replacement theology. Well, it's not biblical. And it, it will confuse you. What we're seeing in this end times program is a swing back to who? Israel. It's all, everything's coming back to Israel. So we're going to wrestle with this here. I'm going to read the, uh, the uh, opening couple paragraphs here, three, uh, that he uses. He says, in conjunction with his second coming, and, and this is on page uh, 
92, in conjunction with the second coming to earth, Jesus will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. Greek language scholar Heinrich uh, Ringstorf Ringstorf, uh, claimed the verb translated will send refers to a commission that requires the person who is sent to speak and act exactly how the sender would speak and act. In other words, he said the emphasis rests on the fact of sending in conjunction with the one who sends, not on the one who is sent. So what's he saying? The focus should never be on those angels going out to gather the elect. The focus is on Jesus gathering a elect people, a chosen people, the ones he has elected, and calls his elect to himself. So, so that's what's in view. Those sent represent their sender and his authority. So let's just forget the next paragraph and move on. He moves right into the identification of Christ's elect. Now, there are those who would take this elect to be the rapture of the church. Uh, wrongly. Uh, th- that is not what's in view. There's another passage in Matthew that, that we'll deal with where the two are grinding at the will of one's taken and the other is left. That passage, many people take that. That's rapture. Well, they're wrong on that one too because it's judgment that's in view. It's entrance into the kingdom that's in view. Here, here, what we see is that is not what's in view here. And we have solid reasons ourselves because we're, I'm, I'm a pre-tribulation uh, rapture of the church guy. I am. Uh, and I believe that it is the, 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 I, uh, what, what's so, uh, it is the best position as it relates to staying consistent with the scriptures without based on, without being based on any Denials. You let the scriptures pretty much say what they're saying. And, and you can understand it. And by the way, Showers wrote, the, in my mind, the definitive study on the rapture of the church. Someday we might revisit it. I don't know how many of you have ever been through that study. How many have gone through that with me? There should be several here have gone through Maranatha, our Lord come. But not very many. We probably need to hit it again somewhere down the road. But, but that study, is if you want to read and you really want to know, and you're willing to stretch yourself, read that study. Uh, because it's, it's very scripturally based. You'll move right through and by the time you're done, you're like, yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> that, that's, that's where we're at. But, but a lot of people take this to represent... Uh, the actual rapture of the church. Reading at the bottom of the page there, he says, Who are the elect whom the holy angels will gather at Christ's second coming after the great tribulation? Some sincere Christian believe, Christians believe they are church saints. They believe in Matthew 24, Christ was referring to the rapture of the church in conjunction with the second coming. In that, If that view were correct, the church would have to endure all or part of the great tribulation before being removed from the earth. That's the that's the one of the major, major problems with it, is because if that's the case, what are we talking about? The second coming. When does the second coming happen? At the end of the tribulation. Right, it's one of the la- one of the latter events before he judges all the you know slot. The, the, the Megiddo, the Battle of Armageddon, all of that. Uh, but, but you'd have to put the church deep into the tribulation. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.9 tells us what? I have not appointed, we're not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain deliverance or salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Several factors, he says in the end here, indicate the gathering of the elect in Matthew 4. 2431 refers not to the rapture, but to the gathering of the remnant of Israel alive on earth when Jesus returns. And that's exactly the position that we take. You may not know you take it, but as your pastor, I take it. So I'm hoping you, you're, you're taking that position. If you're not, you're, you're, you're okay to not take it, but you're wrong. But we'll go on. 
He gives us several, uh, he's going to hit on several uh, factors here. First factor he points out to us is that the term elect in the Bible is not exclusive to the church saints. We are called the elect of God. We're elect, you're elect, I'm elect. It's all over uh, in the New Testament uh, epistles. We're elect. We're part of the elect of God. But it doesn't, that term isn't only used of us, the church. It's not exclusive to the church. Now the term bride in the New Testament, that's us. It, that's not one you can attach to Israel. We're the bride. We are the bride of Christ. But we'll, 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 we may talk about that later on. But anyhow, the first term, uh, the first, the term elect is, is not exclusive to the church. Second, no biblical evidence indicates the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. In God's plan. Israel remains God's elect nation. And the fact that he says nation helps us understand uh, more specifically that, that, that point. The church has never, no, there isn't anywhere in Scripture, you can make it, you, you can go to the grafted in, you can go to the passage where it says, we are the children of Abraham. We sing the song, Father Abraham, when we're, we teach the little kids that. And how, does, how do Gentiles sing that? How, 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 yeah, we're, we're, we are, we're grafted in, we're spiritual, we are of the spiritual lineage of Abraham, but we're not of the biological lineage, we're not of that national identity. He made national uh, promises to them, and that's what he's saying. Third, Jesus' description of the gathering of the elect. From the four winds from one end of heaven to the other echoes Old Testament prophecies of God gathering the nation of Israel. Uh, so here in Matthew 24, 31 in the Olivet Discourse, he says he's going to send his angels, he's going to blow the trumpet, he's going to gather them from where? The four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Okay, He's going to gather them. He's going to gather them up. This third point, what he's saying is, is that reference that Jesus makes that's made multiple times in the Old Testament with reference to who? Who's in the Old Testament? Is the church over there? No, we're not even there yet. He's talking to Israel. He's talking to the nation Israel. He uses the exact same terminology of gathering them from the four corners of the earth. And he's going to go ahead and he's going to make that point. We're going to read these verses, by the way. Israel as God's elect. Let's move through here. Now, this whole portion of Israel as God's elect, actually, he breaks it down into like, I don't know, seven, eight different uh, dark, you know, the dark printed. Uh, what's a word? It's escaping me. Yeah, the bold face type for each of the various sections in his discussion. But really, the idea of God's elect here, the discussion of Israel as God's elect, it takes in all the way to page 99. All the way through. It's all about the fact that they are God's elect nation. And we need to understand that. If you've ever listened to Marty, and especially in the past... I'd say the past four times Marty's been up here, which would take in several, many years. His, his discussion with the church has really sat down on this idea of replacement theology. And the reason for that is because that is rampant in today's, quote, church. Israel is rejected. We are Israel. And they believe that. They, they believe that. And, uh, and so it, it, it's, it's whole doctrinal theological systems and offshoots that have uh, developed because of a misunderstanding in that regard. They'd say we're, we're by the way, they're going to say we're out to lunch on it. You need to understand that. You sit down with somebody who differs with you and they're going to look at me and say you're wrong. And I'm going to look at them and say no, you're double wrong. <laughs> 
and then we'll triple wrong and then we'll keep going. But, but the reality is, is you've got to look at the Word of God. And see what's here. And this is what he tries to do. He's trying to show us that in the Old Testament, what Jesus said here in, in, in the Olivet Discourse, he makes references to in the Word of God in the Old Testament. Look at Deuteronomy 6 7. Moses told the people of Israel, this is on midway down on 94. Moses told the people of Israel, quote, this is out of Deuteronomy, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself elect chosen same same idea same same uh that's what we're talking about a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth the word translated means set apart or consecrated commenting on this and other similar statements in deuteronomy language scholar g quell wrote the, that deuteronomy Established the concept of election in the sense of the designation of Israel as the people of God. With regard to election, the nations, he wrote, did not experience what Israel experienced. Out of all the peoples of the earth, he chose, and he, and by the way, he made Israel. Uh, he, he took Abraham and took him out of, from his own homeland, told him to go to a land I'm going to show you. And then he, he ultimately changed his name from Abram. We're going to see that to Abraham. And he created and made a nation after he made that covenant. But anyhow, 1 Chronicles 16, 13. O seed of Israel, his servant, that is the Lord's servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Who's chosen? The children of Israel. Isaiah 45, 4. God called the nation Israel my elect. Romans eleven twenty eight and 29. This is New Testament. The Apostle Paul told the church saints in Rome, quote, concerning the gospel, they, that is the Jewish people, are enemies for your sake. What's he talking about enemies for your sake? I'm just asking if you've got an idea what he's saying there. He's talking, we're in the New Testament now, and in Paul's writing, he says, concerning the gospel, what gospel? The gospel of Christ. They, the Jewish people, are enemies for your sake. Whose sake? The Gentiles' sake. But how are they enemies? They rejected Jesus. They're, they, they're in abeyance. They're enemies of the cross at this point because they've rejected Jesus. But concerning... The, the election, the election, they, who's the they? The Jews, Israel, are beloved for the sake of the fathers. What fathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, those ones who the covenant was established with, reiterated, reiterated, reiterated. So he says, for the gifts, now listen to this, for the gifts and the calling of God are what? What's that? What's that mean? They're, it, it, you can't, they're not, there's no going back on them. It's established. It's settled. It's settled. I love it because it's settled theology. It is. Who's Israel? They'll be there. How do you know? Because he said they will. How do I know that? He said it's not based on them. It's irrevocable. He entered into this. It's a done deal. It's a settled matter from the time God said it. So what's that mean? That means there's got to be an Israel. There can't be a replacement. He made a, a national promise, an individual promise to Jewish people. And he said this is the way it's going to be. And that's an irrevocable situation. But that came out of the New Testament, by the way. New Testament language scholar Gottlob Shrink. Pointed out, Paul used the term for the election of all Israel in the fathers. Here the reference is not to a part, but to the whole people. Paul thereby indicated, although Israel had disobeyed and rebelled against God numerous times, Israel was still his beloved elect nation. I love it. Uh, because if you go back over and read, you can do this sometime if you want to, but go over to Romans and start in chapter 9 through chapter 11. That's all about Israel. And, and the fact that God, if God hadn't made the covenant and resort, re, resorted to His own uh, prerogatives of deity in order to choose 
them, there would be no Israel. But because He is God and because He had made those covenants and because it was not based on them but Him, there will always be an Israel. And praise God, you can say the same for any one of us. If He hadn't done what He did, there would be no us. We, we, would, we wouldn't be there either. Now, he goes on. He's going to build the case. He's continuing this case. Israel remains God's elect nation. The Old Testament talked all about him being the elect. Okay, it, 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 what, what he says over here, he's going to send forth his angels to gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other, his elect. We see that in the Old Testament that the term elect or chosen of God was all over the place as it related to the the people Israel. Now he's going to say it hasn't changed. Okay? And it hasn't. And he's going to make the case. Here's why it hasn't changed. You can underline this at the top. Because of the irrevocable covenant God established with Israel's ancestors. What do we call those in theology? The un unconditional covenants there's no conditions on these covenants for their fulfillment to be realized it's going to happen why because it's it's based on the person of God himself he swore by himself that this will happen no matter what it's going to happen and so it's critical Who are these ancestors? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel remains God's elect. He has neither abandoned them nor permanently cast them off. And the following passages affirm the covenant. Genesis 12 is where you're going to find the covenant. All right, I'm going to read this and see if you get something here. Now the Lord said to Abraham, what did I say wrong? Abram, not Abraham yet. Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis twelve seven. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. Genesis 13, 4 through 14 through 15. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, he said this, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And then he says, note the word forever. And you should note the word forever. Why? Because forever means what? Forever. (laughs) You get that? Uh, I don't know what forever means to you. Forever until I trip. Praise God when he says, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I give you what? Eternal life. What's that? Forever life. Eternal forever until I trip. No. What is it? If I trusted in Christ, I have what kind of life? I have eternal life. And that's what he's saying. That's the point he wants us. He said, what he's saying to us is don't miss that. The psalmist says, Selah. He stops us when he wants us to, wants to, he says, think about that. You know, when you're reading in the Psalms and you come to a, a, a stanza and it says, Selah. Uh, Chuck Svoboda always said, think about that. <laughs> because what, he's, what, what the writer is saying is, slow down here. Don't miss what I just said. Don't miss it. And what he's saying, when you see forever, note that. Okay, Genesis 15, 13, 14, and 18. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river Euphrates to the great river the Euphra- uh, uh, excuse me river Egypt and to the great river Euphrates on that same day God also clearly defined what he meant by Abram's descendants know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years and also the nation whom they serve I will judge 
Afterward, they shall call out with, uh, with great possessions. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read this, even though it's not a verse, because it's important. Because what he's going to tell us, who went into, who went in, who was in exile for 400 years? Who do we know? Who do you know in the Bible? Israel. Egypt had him for 400 years before he raised up Moses to go down there and be his representative and, and bring him out. So we know who he's talking about, and that's what he says. God obviously, in this passage, was referring to Israel's enslavement in Egypt for 400 years. He later delivered them out of Egypt, and they escaped with great wealth from the Egyptians. You can look in Exodus, Exodus, he tells them. Genesis 17, 5, 7, and 8. God changed Abram's name to Abraham and declared... I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generation. Now, I want to to pause here for a minute. See, this verse right here to me, if he made the church the fulfillment for Abraham, what does that do to this? Just a simple, listen to what he says. This is what God says. I will establish my covenant between who? Me and... And you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Abraham. Okay? He's talking to a man. He said, I'm going to make a covenant between me and you. And then he says, and your descendants. What is that? What do you think Abraham understands when he says that? If I said to you, I'm going to make a covenant between me and and you and your descendants, what am I saying? Put it in your language. What, what am I saying? Your children, your progeny, your generations, those who will follow, who are connected physically, biologically to you, I make a promise. So what does that do with this, the idea that the church... I'm telling you, I, I just put myself in Abraham's shoes and I say, okay, if God did that, is he t- did, he, did he fulfill his promise to me? And he didn't. If he, if he made the church Israel, he did not fulfill that to me. Because he said to me that I'm making a promise between you and me. Me and you. And, I'm, and your descendants. Your descendants. Well, we know what that means. My, his children, his progeny, those who will be as many as the stars of heaven. I just think it, it's not rocket science. Let the scriptures speak and take them for what they say and then follow it through. And you get to the end and you're like, that's what he said. He said it in Genesis. And you get, you're in Revelation and you followed it all the way through and you, and you didn't have to do anything but follow it and let God speak. Let, let, it, let it say what it says. But anyway, after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan as a what? Everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Note the words everlasting covenant and everlasting possession. Now, I want you to note something else. There's a word used throughout that whole, those verses. They're all, it's all over the place. You know what it is? It's the personal pronoun. I, 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 I. I will, I will, I am. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I make this problem. I, 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 I. Who's saying that? That's God. He's saying what? I'm going to do this. He didn't say, if you do this, I will do that. He said, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. That's why when he made the covenant, who went through the, when he split the sacrifices, who went through there? He put him to sleep before he went through. Because it's a covenant that he personally swore on himself. On himself. It's all, it all rests in the person of who he is. That's why when he says, I give you eternal life. He tells me, you trust in in the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe in, in, in the Son of God, the only begotten Son. And if you believe in Him, you should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
It's in Him. That promise is on Him. I trust He he saves me eternally so. Eternally so. Well, if you give up that trust, then you're not, you never were. Well, boy, that's a... That's a sad way to go through your Christian experience. I don't know how you can ever have joy. I don't know how you can ever have peace. The whole idea you can lose your salvation to me is, is flies in the face of all the other doctrine. You know, those, those passages that tell us how we ought to be able to walk thankfully and joyfully and with a peace that passeth all understanding. If you thought you could lose your salvation the next moment, it's crazy. It's crazy. I look at him. It's all been... The whole doctrine of eternal security, honestly, finds its, finds its, its uh, foundation, its, its rock, its stability in the very person of Jesus Christ. People don't want to reduce it to that place, but that's exactly where you have to go. Because if he said, I give you eternal life and you can lose it, then that, that is an affront to say that you can lose it to the very character of God. Because he said that, I, that he is truth, he cannot lie, he will not, he's... he's there is no falsehood in him, and so you, you, you can't do that. Well, that, that's here as well with these covenants. Moses is, well, first Ishmael and Isaac. This is an interesting point he raises. Who's Ishmael? And it's hot and fire in here. Who's Ishmael? Okay, Ishmael was what son? Well, yeah, but what one? Oh, of Hagar, but first, what son? First, first son. He was the first son. Oh, I just want to make a point. Who is he? He's he is Abraham's son. But remember, remember, they understood. Abraham had, and it, Sarah understood that these promises of God. He promised that they would have descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven. And she sees herself dried up and old, and no children. And she's like, how in the world is this going to, how, how is this going to happen? Well, that's what Scripture said. That's, you can laugh at it all you want. But that's the language of Scripture. Her womb was dried up. And, and the thing is, is she, she understood that he was supposed to have what? The church. She understood that she could be infertile because the church would be the descendants. No. Why was it such an issue with her? She understood fully that it was the seed of Abraham, the descendants, the biological descendants of Abraham that these promises were made. Well, then she gets the cart before the horse because she's like, this isn't happening. And she convinces Hagar to go into Abraham. And then Abraham goes into Hagar and they, they have Ishmael. What's God say? No, not Ishmael. It's not going to be Ishmael. Why is that? Because that's not the one. That wasn't the path. What did he say? Of your and she was his wife. She was his wife. And so the, 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 the right the right child would be born of Sarah. And he goes on and confirms it. Remember, they, they laughed about it. Sarah laughed. That ain't happening, huh? You know, and he's like, yeah, it will. And, and uh, God got the last laugh. And in her 90s, she gave birth to Isaac, right? She gave birth to, to Isaac. And we'd all laugh about that. Somebody 90 had a baby. <laughs> Even in our time, it'd be like, are you kidding me? <laughs> but uh, it happened. <clears throat> it happened. He was the covenanted line. Hebrews, if you flip over there, I just want to show you something that's cool. Because uh, it, it, people will say to you, well, we're son-, they try to reduce this. I'm getting way off field here, but way, way off field. But people who want to reduce Jesus to just being another child of God, like those who say he's not the he's not the son of God, they will argue that we, we're also called the children of God. We're all sons of God as well. But. This is a great passage for that argument. It's over in Hebrews chapter 11. But I'm making a point regarding uh, Abraham here. But uh, I want to get here first. Let me find the actual. But Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, 
offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises. Who received the promises? And what are we talking about? Abraham, and God's Abraham Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, received the promises. What, what are those promises? The unconditional covenant was offering up his what? Is he, was he his only son, Isaac? No. What was he? He was the unique son. He was the son of promise. Just as Jesus is the unique son, he's the only begotten of the Father. He's not the only son. I'm a son of, of, of God. You guys are sons of God. We're considered that. But it doesn't diminish who Jesus is at all. He is uniquely the son in a unique capacity. He's the, he is the son of God. He is the second person of the one triune God. Well, Abraham was offering up the, the promised one. And it was a test of his faith. His faith on what? Well, it was a test of his faith in what regard? There you go. So what, what, was it, what was he saying? I'm going to see if you believe that those covenants that I made to you, will, that, that I will make them happen. They're going to happen. He had to realize, he had to realize, there probably isn't any more children coming from Sarah. <laughs> right? She, I mean, she, she had this, this one. He had to realize that when he offered up Isaac, that God would have to raise him. And he was willing to do that. He was, and why did he do it? Because God had made promises. He had made unconditional covenants with him. So if God required this of me right now, then I, I can do that because I know God will make it happen. He will, he will make this happen. It will happen. And so he did that. Then Moses' statement. Let's continue on. Let's continue on here. Remember, Abraham, Isaac... And Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self. Do you get that? Remember, he's, he, Moses is, is talking to God. And he's, he's asking God to remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of. I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it. For what? Forever. 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 But, but what did he swear by? He swore by your own self. What's he reminding God of here? Those unconditional covenants. God's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smite these people. <laughs> they're so rebellious. They're so stiff-necked. They're, they're so, you know... In, Got to get rid of, you know, I'm, I'm just going to per- be done with them. And he's like, wait a minute. Did, did Moses need to remind him? No, he didn't. But, but for our sakes, it, it speaks to the reality of these, these covenants. They, God is bound to them and they're going to come to pass. It will happen. David's statement to God. And who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land. Before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods. For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever. How long are they his people? Forever. Forever. No, the church is Israel. I love it because I'm, I've really got your mind now. Because if you go into a church and they start throwing that out there, you're going to be like, boom, 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 boom. They're off. They're way out there. Because they are. They are. And, and I'm not going to go into, if they're off there, they're going to be off all the way through. You have to really do some, some uh, real dancing with Scripture to make those doctrines stand up all the way through. It, it becomes very difficult because of why? Because of all these clear passages that we're reading here. 
For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. God's statement concerning Israel's rebellion, and this is as far as we'll be able to go today. The land also shall be left empty by them and will, and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will accept their guilt because they despise my statutes and because their soul abhorred my statutes, my judgments and my statutes. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, listen to what he says, I will not cast them away. Why are they there? Why are they in Babylon? Why were they taken in exile to Babylon and Assyria? Why are they there? For their rebellion. For worshiping other gods. For idolatry. And what does God say? Even, even though they're in that land as a chastisement, for their, for their rebellion, for not even worshiping me, he did not replace them. Now, did some of them die lost and go to hell because they rejected God and his statutes? I'm sure they did. But the nation, the descendants of Abraham, they still remain. They still remain. I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them to utterly destroy them. And what? Break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. But for their sake I will remember the covenant of their... What's he talking about? I made a promise. And I love this. Because it means something to me. He keeps his word to Abraham. Not just the nation Israel. He said, I will not break that covenant I made with who? Your ancestors. What's he talking about? He's talking about individuals. He's talking about individual people. That's why I keep saying, you've wondered, why do you keep saying, why do you make such a big deal that if he break, that, that if, if it doesn't ring true with Abraham, he didn't keep his word with him like the replacement? That's why. Because God keeps pointing right back to that individual. He said to Abraham. So when God promises the individual something, that means something. He doesn't bypass that. He doesn't, he doesn't bypass their understanding of the promise or anything. He knows what Abraham understood because Abraham understood him rightly. And he continues to repeat that. That I'm, The reason I can't do this and I won't do this is because I made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David. He, he made these promises along the way, reiterated them. He will not break them. I will remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. Who's that? Israel. In the light of the nations. They're different from all the other nations. We have nations there. That I might be their God and I am the Lord. So I, I hope you're getting an idea on this whole replacement theology. I know it doesn't probably mean a lot to you because you've been immersed in a church where uh, we've been where we're at. And I've taken you through eschatology, big time. We went through the whole book of Pentecost. I've talked to other pastors, they're like, what did you do to them? <laughs> to you? I said, we went all the way through that whole book. And uh, we've, we've marched all the way through eschatology. But the reality is, is that Israel will be there. And this elect that he's going to gather, it's Israel. They're, they're, they've been dispersed. We'll look at that next time. They're all over the globe. They're all over the globe. They've, they've had to disperse all over the world. And at the end, when he comes back, he's going to gather all the believing remnant. They have to be there. And guess what? They have to be there to go into that millennial experience. And that's why we'll find in Revelation, that's why Satan is so uh, uh, determined to just utterly destroy Israel. We've seen that already happening. It's happening today uh, anti-Semitism is on the rise big time. 
Even within the halls of our own government, you got people spewing nonsense how they want to turn the laws on the Jews and all this stuff. I mean, that's not good stuff. And we should rise up against that big time. Uh, and say, you know, that, that, that is not the people we want in office. Uh, that, that are haters of Israel. Why? Well, we know what God, where God holds them. How does He view them? They're His elect nation. That's who they are. And it ought to mean something to God's people. But anyhow, let's pray together. Lord, we love You. We thank You for our time here. I pray You go into the worship hour uh, ahead of us, Lord. Bring it all together for Your glory. Give to each one. As necessary, as necessary clarity of thought and speech, and just bless your word today. And uh, may everything uh, work together to glorify you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.